Hello, everyone? Yes, we can start. Super. Okay. Um, welcome, everyone. Um, I'm, my, my name is Patricia Carbone. I'm the head of Revolve Mediterranean and also the communications manager of the Interreget Med Green Growth Community. And it's a pleasure to be here today, even though online, uh, within the framework of the COP27. And for those who are following us online, my colleagues are now at the Mediterranean Pavilion, in which the Interreget Med program participates as a partner. So today, the Interreget Med Green Growth and Blue Growth communities uh, have been organizing the, this event with the main goal of sharing solutions to promote and adopt circular economy strategies for climate change mitigation and adaptation. We are very happy to be contributing to the Solutions Day, which is happening today. And this is a very crucial theme in a very important moment of time, plenty of high expectations uh, to really take climate action seriously and implement the solutions at the ground that we need to see now. Solving means adapting and adapting means mindset change. So this is exactly what we need uh, to focus on the way forward if we want to embrace resilient societies in the Mediterranean region. And for this to happen, I think we need to start asking us questions. We need to ask ourselves, how can we adapt our regions and prepare for what's coming you know, with the effects of climate change? So I think we, we all need to, to look at our communities to, that we have around to have a more bottom-up approach to adaptation and resilience that is driven by solidarity, that is driven by empathy uh, with the most vulnerable societies as well. We need to look uh, and learn more about our shared regional challenges to come up with joint solutions to ensure climate justice. I think this is a, a very key message that I want to stress today because I think solutions need to make sense at a local uh, level, uh, taking into account the local needs and building skills for citizens, which I think it's what these two communities today are trying to, to address. Climate solutions that, that leave someone behind will continue to raise some instabilities and continue to raise the risk for climate threats. So we need to deliver fairness through a just transition a phrase that we should use more and with purpose. I think this is very important. And in today's event, we will be presenting what these communities have been able to achieve thanks to the Interreget Med program, thanks to the transnational cooperation, and also to share a common vision for the future because the journey has just started. So we will be hearing from leading experts in the circular green and blue economy um, and also addressing some of the results that can be taken uh, as tangible results for the near years to come. So I'm going to pause here and actually present a video that we have put together to introduce what the, the, our contribution is for today's event. Thank you. We urgently need a change. We need to implement effective measures to adapt and mitigate to the multiple effects of climate change. Easier said than done. At the Interimed program, we strive to create the best climate for a change. We combine commitment, ideas and resources to devise solutions for mitigating and adapting to climate change in the Mediterranean. To do this, we work with cities, regions and national governments, universities and research centres, citizens associations, interest groups and NGOs, small and medium enterprises. We strive to have all the stakeholders on board to develop community-based solutions in a wider transnational cooperation framework while keeping a mission-driven approach. Our main goals are to foster an innovative and sustainable economy, to protect and restore our natural heritage, to promote greener living areas, and enhance sustainable tourism in the region. In other words, to make the Mediterranean green transition happen. The Mediterranean region warms 20% faster than the rest of the world. 
This means that the impact of climate change will be more severe in the Mediterranean than anywhere else in the world. And local authorities will be at the forefront as they play a pivotal role in adaptation and mitigation. In this context, I believe that the Interreg Euromed program mission is crucial and that we have to create the best climate for a change. I mean, we have to create the conditions for local and regional authorities to work with other stakeholders at transnational level to develop solutions for their local needs that can be transferred, replicated and scaled up. We wanted to bring the climate emergency of the Mediterranean region in the spotlight. So we decided to create the Med Pavilion at the COP27. For this, we joined forces with key stakeholders and organizations to show the challenges we all face and how we complement each other. For the Interreg Med Euromed program, it will be the occasion to showcase what we have already achieved to mitigate and adapt to climate change and how we will build on those results to make the Mediterranean green transition happen in the future. From 2014 to 2022, we have founded 142 transnational cooperation projects. In 13 countries and 57 regions, involving 837 beneficiary organizations. While in the new programming period, we plan to invest 294 million euros in 14 countries and 69 regions with one common goal, to make the Mediterranean green transition happen. Well, um, we'll pick up from here. Uh, Patricia, hi. Uh, here is COP27 Charm. Uh, we will pick it up from here. Thank you very much for the video and for your presentation. So let's get into the subject matter straight away. You effectively spoke and explained that creating connections brings to solutions and it brings to various stakeholders talking to each other, and it brings that the solutions are community-based, which is something very important. And so I would give uh, the, word, the, the floor immediately to Sergio Ponsa, project coordinator and director of uh, Beta Technological Center, and I'd like you to ask you how, what are the challenges ahead and how do you ensure that all the stakeholders are online and that steps are made forward because there are quite a lot of stakeholders involved in the Mediterranean in my mitigating climate change because I mean various countries, various governments, various communities and of course green and green and blue economy you have to bring you have to connect the dots not easy well, well first of all i would like just to thank the interact med and the organization for for inviting me to to this panel so it's a big pleasure to be here so the question is not si easy to, to answer of course but uh, first of all so uh, in order to do that to engage all the actors so we need the right tools and the right initiatives to do that and this these initiatives should engage all of them should consider the opinion and the objectives of all of them, and then see what we can produce to really achieve the, the right objectives. But in all this a scenario, that is not simple, as I told you. So for me, the policy makers, the poli policy authorities or governments, they play an essential role because they are responsible for setting the scene, for setting the right frame framework to make everything happen in the right direction. So in this sense, uh, all the actors that you mentioned will be, should be ready in order to provide the right information to the policy makers in order that they can make this right policy strategies or policy framework that will ensure the fair transition to, 
to climate change adaptation, mitigation, and, and the circular bioeconomy production. So, uh, and I would like to stress that. So, programs such as the Interreg Med, they invested a lot of efforts in defining the right architecture, but also to having the right initiatives in order to, to proceed in this way. So, how to gather the information that is being produced by an incredible amount of, of innovation projects, as we've seen in the video. So, uh, how we can capitalize all this information and mainstream this information to policymakers in order to, to allow them to, to do this, this, this work, right? And um, on the other side, I would like also to stress that this is essential to be carried out not just in the Interreg Med program, that Interreg Euromed, that is how it's going to be called in the next, in the next pro programming period, but also other programs that are working on innovation, innovation in which all kind of factors are being involved. So we are not talking about innovation carried out by universities, it's innovation carried out by the five elix of factors, and so other programs should do the same. So it should be aligned to this kind of, of activities in which, uh, well, tools in which we have resources, we have the framework, and we have the tools to capitalize that results in order to, to make policymakers to take the right decisions. Well, thank you. And uh, from where you left off, I would like to give the word to Alessandra Sensi. She's head of the Environment and Green and Blue Economy, and the economy is actually the focus of this panel. Uh, yeah, sorry, the mic. And, uh, well, so, I mean, he portrayed and uh, he told us about the various stakeholders that have to work together, but what are the challenges to make them work together? Because they also come from different cultures, different, different garments, different challenges that they face. So uh, what are the bottlenecks and what are the challenges that you are facing? And what do you think one should still be done or can be done to overcome them. Thank you very much. Uh, and it's a great pleasure indeed to be here with you today. Um, the, at the UFM, uh, we have indeed in a certain way launched this process related to green and blue economy. And it's a great pleasure to be here with you all at uh, COP27 to see these uh, processes converging. Um, I'd like actually to mention that it's uh, in our mandate, indeed, to bring together different stakeholders and different cultures. It's the core of the mandate of the 42 Euro Mediterranean country. It's in the essence of our work. So the architecture, as uh, Sergio was just mentioned, was uh, particularly important. We operate at a different level, a very political one, indeed, through ministerial declarations. And uh, indeed, in 2014, we kick off with the one on environment and climate change, and 2015, with the one on blue economy, which were uh, renewed in terms of political uh, commitment just last year, and both of them, and not by accident, on the same year, together with other relevant ones, for example, the energy one, the one on employment, the one on innovation. And uh, um, we translate, actually, and this is actually the most difficult, as you were saying, to translate these political uh, convergence, these political recommendations into actions. Therefore, in our setting, we have uh, dedicated uh, working groups, platforms, where uh, multi-stakeholder uh, mechanism has been uh, set in place, where still the countries are there as, of course, the referees and the final decision makers. But the process uh, embeds the participation into the elaboration of the decision in terms of translation of the political decision into actions with regional stakeholders, being regional organization, being civil society. We saw that this morning also within the other event on blue economy, private sector, academia, and uh, uh, so on. Of course, these are crucial actors for the implementation. Uh, we know that also the resources at national level are limited, so the role of all these key actors is very important. And uh, um, this uh, participatory approach is already uh, producing very uh, important results. I think that today we can build on this success already in terms of cooperation. A pavilion is here, and it's, uh, let's say, the most visible expression of uh, 
our advanced cooperation at Mediterranean level. I'd like actually to say by reminding that uh, uh, we launched that in 2014, 2015, of course with others. There is nothing we can do on our own. So we do by default uh, everything with other stakeholders. That in um, five, six, seven years, there has been an enormous acceleration. So in the cooperation, which is actually what is needed and was also the call by our, let's say, uh, policy makers uh, last year at Mediterranean level, we don't need to launch. It was launched already, the process, that this important transition, we need to accelerate. There is a pace uh, uh, given by the urgency of uh, climate change that, as it was mentioned by our Interagmed uh, um, colleagues, is actually marking uh, strongly these years. So the process ideally should be uh, equally uh, accelerated. I would say that this is the bottleneck at the moment, the fact that uh, processes take much longer, I mean, uh, than uh, the pace that is needed to match the climate change uh, challenges. Just a final word to say that uh, uh, Interagmed uh, has been visionary uh, indeed uh, in creating these uh, communities. Um, it's important to mention that we labeled, among others, uh, the governance uh, uh, program, actually, of the Interagmed. This comes also from the previous communities they had, and that, again, will be merged, will be merging this green and blue, still maintaining, of course, the operational uh, divisions which are needed for action to be carried out. We still have uh, to work on different matters, land and sea and so on interconnected, but of course uh, sometimes and somehow a bit uh, different, but again, uh, maintaining this uh, integrated uh, that approach. I don't want to take more time, but thank you very much. Uh, well, I have a, got a quick follow-up question, and I, uh, but I, I will want to put the same question also to other speakers otherwise, but because, uh, yes, I mean, you, you are connecting blue and green economy because they can't be separated. Now there are new challenges. I'm talking especially about the war in Ukraine. Mm -hmm. And that pose also great challenge to blue and green growth. Mm -hmm. How are you tackling that and what you, uh, should we be bracing for in the future? I mean, this is a difficult question to answer. Of course, I mean, the immediate effect of this could be the device, as you can imagine, also financial resources which the region has benefited so far for uh, other uh, purposes. We still try to maintain and will keep on maintaining the momentum uh, high. I mean, um, there are many active uh, actors actually uh, of the region within the conflict uh, itself for the try to uh, mediate. Uh, and we hope uh, that, uh, let's say, a positive uh, solution can be found, uh, uh, especially through the, um, let's say, mediation of these actors. This said, it's already impacting the region, obviously. I mean, uh, with, uh, I mean, simply with the issues related, you know, to food uh, uh, security. And, uh, you know, many times uh, we have heard that we could uh, quickly face a food crisis. So again, uh, by mobilizing all the actors, uh, we, um, hope that uh, uh, a joint solution can be found. And actually it's this spirit of collaboration and cooperation uh, that it's also happy, uh, helping not only, for example, respect to food, but also respect to energy. So yeah, through, of course. Of course, uh, of course it, it tackles okay, many problems. I will problems. leave it here. Yeah. Okay, no, thank because you. It is a very difficult question, but I mean, I think it, that's in the back of everybody's mind, I suppose. Now, I, I, I want to um, ask Matteo Bocci, uh, you know, you all know him, Deputy Leader, West Med Assistance Mechanism. So let's get back to the Mediterranean, to the sea. What are the most urgent challenges now that the Mediterranean is facing and what needs urgently to be done? Yes, thank you. <coughs> thank you, Maria. Apologies, I think I'm a, I, at this point in time I'm a casualty of air conditioning, so my voice might be a bit, a bit bombing, but I'll do my best. Um, so maybe a step back uh, b before getting to your question. Um, just explaining briefly or reminding briefly what the WestMed uh, initiative is and the assistance mechanism. We like to create a lot of names, but in short, basically the WestMed initiative is a strategic initiative uh, between 
the so-called five plus five countries uh, in the northern shore, so from uh, Portugal to Italy via France, Spain, uh, to Malta, sorry, France, Spain, Italy, and on the southern shore from Libya to Mauritania, so via uh, Tunisia, um, Algeria, Morocco. So it's a quite diverse uh, group of countries. Uh, it's a subset, so to say, of the West Med. It's a subsea basin, I would like to call it. And, and the assistance mechanism is a support mechanism to that, and we are coordinating that. And the, the um, s building on what colleagues said, I think the, the West Med gets a bit more at the lower level in terms of implementation. So not lower in terms of importance, but it gets more operational. Um, because on the one hand, it's a policy platform of dialogue between ministries. But then the priorities identified by ministry result in cooperation and support that we provide as assistance mechanism to create solutions. And solutions are projects, uh, projects that are channeled by Interreg, with, with whom we have a strong partnership, and are projects that are meant to address the challenge. So I'm getting to your question, a bit of a detour. Um, there are a lot of challenges and a lot of opportunities. The, the blue economy as such is a variety, is, is almost a concept and not a, a sector. So you deal with transport, you deal with aquaculture, um, which is uh, farming fish for production of food, but also for added value um, resources and products like bio cosmetics and, and all the rest. Um, uh, we deal with tourism, coastal and maritime tourism. So there I it's, it's, a, it's a huge um, range of areas. Maybe going back to your, to your uh, Black Sea question, I don't want to enter that that much, but it might be a hook to, to focus a bit. And uh, maybe two challenges I would like to, uh, or opportunities I would like to mention. So uh, one is certainly energy. So having access to sustainable energy, both in terms of environmentally sustainable, but also affordable and stable energy sources is key. It's key for the economy, it's key for the people. And um, uh, marine renewable energies uh, has been so far a bit of a darling of the northern uh, sea, the Atlantic and the North Sea, but is uh, also due to a strong political push and incentive is now becoming an important element in the Mediterranean. So what one thing that we do as a uh, West Med, for example, we bring together stakeholder practitioners, individuals and organizations uh, amongst port authorities, amongst um, provider of energy, and we and, and ships and uh, um, carriers of goods and um, by the sea, and, and we help them discuss and identify area of project that then will be funded. Um, I think some colleagues will build on that. Another challenge is, which is also an opportunities, um, opportunity is that of, uh, of aquaculture. So um, aquaculture has historically a bad reputation, I think rightly so, if I might say so, because the, the path was not exceptional, was not good for uh, unsustainable aquaculture, is certainly not good for the environment and not for, for consumers. But sustainable aquaculture, meaning a small scale and a, a circular a circular uh, model, circular based aquaculture is actually uh, good for environment and very good for local jobs and provide high quality fishes. It also can, can also be linked, and this is where circularity joins in. I think again, this concept will be elaborated by colleagues, so I, I will stop it here. But, um, but looking at every step of, we call it value chain, so every step of processing from food uh, to uh, waste management, to diversification of products. All of those um, steps can be circular, therefore reducing uh, um, to zero. There was a very interesting presentation uh, yesterday, I think, you can reduce really to zero waste and, and uh, uh, pollution and increase the added value <coughs> and the return on jobs. And here we bring together a practitioner across the two shore of the of the Mediterranean, the Western Mediterranean, um, and we aim at providing um, a platform for innovation. And in collaboration with Interreg, I think there are two important projects in this area. One is the Blue Deal. Blue Deal is a project funded by Interreg Med <coughs> dealing with uh, renewable energies, marine renewable energies. And uh, the other is a Blue Phasma that we also supported, and Blue Phasma really look at sustainable circular model for aquaculture. So there, um, there are challenges, but uh, these challenges are really solutions. And the real challenge for that, maybe, and I'm done, is 
helping people working together, getting each other, understanding the good practice, things that exist and they work, and using the money of the commission, which is, uh, which, which is getting grower and, and more focus, to use project to bring uh, people that have good experience and people that look for a practice and, and, and have a dialogue and improve. And this is what the West Med Assistance Mechanism is doing. Well, thank you very much, and I will pick up from uh, um, aquaculture, and I will go to uh, Magali Uter, because aquaculture, uh, as he said, I mean, it, uh, it's uh, got a very bad reputation, but if you do it on a small scale, if it is a circular economy, then it looks different. How do you push economy to go towards something that is, let's say, less profitable, but it is more climate friendly. Yes, okay. So how do you push them? Because that is, uh, I mean, basically, I mean, you have to push them towards doing that and you have to push away the big stakeholders. Yeah, thank you for the, the question. Uh, first of all, yeah, if we see, well, in the Mediterranean, fisheries and aquaculture are absolute uh, absolutely well uh, very important for in terms of blue economy and and economics no we have countries that uh, like uh, turkey um, uh, italy spain that are really and greece that are really focused on, on that and um, if we see the trends fisheries i mean the non fish captured by fisheries the trend is quite stable but in terms of aquaculture we see that there is a huge increase and that this will increase in the in the next years, I think this is also due to the no changing. I mean, now we are talking about this blue food, so we see that uh, the protein no, coming from the sea have have a lower uh, footprint. So th there is a big movement there that to have to consume more, more uh, no blue blue food. So aquaculture is a is a reality. Now we need to make it uh, sustainable. And um, in the framework of, uh, well, we work for the SwitchMed, which is a project uh, working on circular economy and, and sustainable consumption and production, supporting the thousand med countries. We had initially, I would say, a green focus, not really focusing on land-based activities. And uh, we have been uh, offered by the, the, the commission to also translate the approach of SwitchMed uh, into the blue economy sector, blue, blue economy sector. So we made a study on how to integrate better circular economy within uh, blue economy, and we did it. Uh, well, we talk a lot about collaboration partnership. So we did it together with the blue growth uh, community, and uh, we have analyzed the opportunity into uh, different sectors. Uh, so we uh, in fisheries and aquaculture, port activities. Uh, fish, bi uh, fish, no, ship <laughs> building and repair, uh, and also recreational boating and, and marinas. And I think by far uh, the sector where there are more opportunities is fisheries and aquaculture, because there are opportunities to implement circular economy at every step of the, of the value chain. So by designing better the fishing gears, for example, so that they can be better collected, and not collected in the sea, collected in the port, to be better uh, recycled. Um, there are opportunities regarding, for example, fishing boats that are made of polystyrene now, and that, that can be, I mean, we can also have a better system, whether to collect them or with different materials. And also uh, opportunities uh, for the, well, there are also the, this, the sector of multi-trophic aquaculture that is, uh, well, um, a very interesting uh, uh, concept that is still, I would say, at the research level and there, like, uh, well, it, it's, it, we see it future, but uh, it's, it's a very complex, no, to, to implement it. And then we have the, all the use of uh, uh, sub-product because when we, no, we take the fish process processing industry, at the end, between uh, 50 and 70% are uh, sub product so we know we do the fish product but then there are huge opportunity and here it's very great to um, make the connection with land based activities because the sub products they can be used well as uh, also food no for for fish but also we can make connection with the pharmaceutical industry with com cosmetics so they are huge development in this sector and also uh, just to mention also the algae sector 
So whether micro or, or, or micro algae, there are a lot a huge of uh, development that I think, uh, well, there will be uh, many development in the next years. So I will stop here. Thank you. Yeah, uh, no, just one follow-up question on circular economy, which is, I mean, sort of the issue here. Now, circular economy, of course, makes sense on an uh, environmental uh, perspective, but uh, how do you push, uh, well, public investors, how do you push all the stakeholders to go for that, even though they might be tempted to do to have a different choice. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that uh, well, circular economy. I think in the Mediterranean region is a reality. So we have many examples of uh, well, we know we manage a community of switcher, the switcher community. We have a lot of example, but it's true that um, well, this switcher they tell us okay, we need also changes now at the policy level. I think what we need also is to have. Uh, this push because circular economy is about to make a systemic change, no? And this cannot be in isolation. So we need really to have this push to say, to have, to say, okay, there are many solutions, but now we need to streamline them into one strategy. And I think that uh, it has to be driven by by government, for sure. It has to be also coordinated, no? Between uh, different uh, uh, stakeholders because otherwise we won't. Uh, well, it will be uh, very, very difficult. Um, and uh, so it needs to be a long-term vision so that also the businesses that have to change, they can make this shift. If it's short-term business, they won't, it's, it's so big the change that they, they, can, they won't be able to do this, uh, this shift. And then the other thing is to uh, be able to measure no? the circularity. Now we are still uh, measuring the GDP, so we need to go also beyond GDP and have a uh, better indicator that measures the circularity of economy. So this is very important. I think that there are two uh, additions, uh, Matteo Bocci and uh, Alessandra Sensi. <laughs> Thank Sensi. you. Very quickly, because I wouldn't want to <coughs> have created some, some misunderstanding. So y you did a great um, session on the banking uh, mis mis misinterpretation and misfacts. And um, in fact, the circular model um, is more uh, economically, you have higher return than less. <coughs> you have higher return because you, you add uh, or um, you have economic gain from waste. So you, you make money from what you threw away. Uh, but also because you reduce um, uh, the, you make a more efficient process. So you, at every step you, you, you make more efficient, you, um, less costly and uh, so, so you gain. Of course you need investment. Um, but this is a, a, a concept that investors understand. In fact, uh, I might say uh, that aquaculture and, and sustainable aquaculture is one of the hot baby for investors because they really understand that by putting money, then you get a lot of return. So actually sustainable and circular is more um, gain than less. And Alessandra, so it, is, it makes more sense, it, it is more logical, but then why isn't the majority of the economy I was, circular? I was uh, exactly you know, about to reply to you and complement along these lines. I mean, because I think you were indeed referring to the economic benefit, no? what is the economic incentive? I mean, uh, Magali mentioned that and Matteo as well. It's even just in the revision of the business model that you can create this efficiency. And what was very interesting, even though the practice carried out at Mediterranean level and was done not by accident, was indeed to put uh, the different even, uh, you know, uh, ministries and representative environment and the industry indeed to emphasize these aspects. Just for example, I mean, when you revise a business model and you see that uh, by revising the model, you need less raw materials, so your water and energy bills are lower and actually you produce less weight, so you pay less or maybe that is put into a circular system, you have an immediate, let's say, uh, economic gain. And that's why some of the investors, and they had actually many cases, if I can complement actually what you were saying, they had many pilot cases, where the investors themselves decided to invest without asking even support from the bank because it, there was an immediate convenience. Other cases of bigger business, of course, required the support of IFIs, but as simple as that, uh, on a smaller scale, this was uh, the positive result created. Well, we are sort of quickly getting from 
uh, environment, into economy, and of course into politics. And that leads us to our next guest, Spiros Kovelis. He's a former deputy minister of the foreign affairs in Greece. Welcome, and thank you for being with us. And of course, I'm in long time in the Mediterranean Commission on Sustainable Development, in the UN for Environmental Protection. So um, I wanted you would go on from here. So um, all this needs intergovernmental cooperation, and there are loads of challenges ahead. And I mean, uh, banking on your experience, I mean, how, what are the bottlenecks and at the moment, I do see, I mean, huge gray clouds on top of Europe. But, I mean, um, what are the solutions that you could bring forward and with whom? Maria, thank you very much. Greetings from Athens to everyone, to uh, all of my good friends in this panel. And I'm really sorry not to be physically there with you. Uh, some of you I haven't seen for a long time, and it would have been great. And also, I would like to congratulate Interreg Med not only for doing this event, but for pushing the agenda of collaboration between the Mediterranean countries, which I think is very important uh, in many ways to answer what you said, Maria, that we need uh, to combine policy with practice, but also to build policy on good practice, because this is something that uh, we see very often, and I saw also as a politician, that sometimes policy follows good examples, good practice, good entrepreneurship, and so on. Uh, so I think that um, although the Mediterranean is a politically complicated region, I believe that we have the possibility by more collaboration between uh, East and, and West, uh, North and South, and throughout the, uh, the Mediterranean region to show good examples, because we have institutions that can help that, UFM nonetheless, Interreg Med, and so on. Um, and I think that if we take some cases, some examples that I would like to share with you about things that happen on, in, in specific terms, let's take circularity that you were discussing with, uh, with Magali and everyone else and materials. There are very good examples of recycling and upcycling. Let me just remind you that there are different um, cases and initiatives of uh, upcycling, fishing nets of upcycling, uh, aquaculture nets and collecting them and creating fresh new plastic without having to, to build new plastic from zero. Uh, even the ghost nets, the ones that are traveling along the, the Mediterranean and impacting very much biodiversity. More collaboration in that and more regulation in the sense of promoting and giving incentives to upcycling rather than putting new materials on the market would be uh, very interesting, very important, and protecting the sea and also the land because lots of them would end up in landfills. One other sector that I can think of is what's happening with cities and biodiversity. Let's remember that the Mediterranean cities are growing at an exponential level. Biodiversity is being still very badly reduced, and there are technological solutions. We've seen solutions that green the outer shell, if you like, of buildings. We see uh, solutions that make better use of water, that create biodiversity spots within cities. All of this needs to be covered, A, by collaboration by sharing good solutions and B, by also giving the incentives uh, for cities to become greener and, and, and more friendly to people and to biodiversity. Then uh, we also have the issue of nature-based solutions. We recently had the opportunity to work with a Mediterranean country to do the assessment in quantitative terms of the environmental and social values of a marine protected area. I think this is very important because it's not only because it provides a sanctuary for biodiversity, but because it can have a very, very big positive impact on livelihoods of humans and also of nature, but also for cultural values and so on. Currently in the Mediterranean, we have uh, just over 110 marine protected areas in 20 countries, and this needs to increase and be better and more, um, more effectively, let's say, managed for the benefit of both nature and human communities. And this is very important. Why I'm saying these examples? Because to answer your question, Maria, I think that um, time and time again, we have seen in Europe, in the Mediterranean, in the Black Sea, as you mentioned before, um, gray or dark clouds. And I think that the best answer for, for dark clouds is to start putting more light in there. And the light will come from implementing good solutions. All of the speakers in this panel are members of institutions that do promote good solutions to have more collaboration rather than less collaboration. Uh, so, you know, wherever you have collaboration, you don't have conflict. 
And since we're speaking also in the context of COP27, there's one comment I wanted to make as I was hearing your discussion about uh, the uh, Black Sea and the Ukraine conflict. And I'm not saying this because I want to name or shame anyone, but I think that if you take among the, the dark clouds the instrumentalization of energy in, in what is happening, I think that this needs to be seen also under the light of a process that slows the progress to fight against climate change. And in that sense, I, th I believe that we're at a, such a critical time that instrumentalization of energy needs to be uh, read as a crime against humanity. It's not a small thing to try to pull back in whichever way all the progress that was made in Paris in 2015 and to do it because uh, we believe more in the dark cloud than in the, in the, uh, in the uh, light solutions, as they say. So I believe in closing that uh, there are a lot of uh, good technologies, there are a lot of good solutions, there are a lot of good institutions that can support collaboration and promote sustainability in the Mediterranean. Uh, but I think we need to put more action to, to words and we need to have much more collaboration. Uh, and when I say much more collaboration, I will repeat north to south and east to west. I believe the Mediterranean is just one region. There is not east and west Mediterranean. And uh, we all come, you know, from the same traveling ancestors that were crossing the Mediterranean. So we need to build on that. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much also because, I mean, as a journalist, I'm usually pessimistic about uh, future. But, I mean, listening to all of you, one gains a bit of hope, and that is really bitterly needed, a bit of hope uh, at the moment. And, uh, well, now our next speaker is uh, from Rome, Caterina Pratico, and we get into, well, into the science. She's the coordinator of Blue growth community and she works at uh, Mar uh, Scienze Marine at the University in Rome. So Caterina, can you take over from there? Yes, uh, good afternoon. Can you see my screen? Uh, uh, we see so. you perfectly well, we hear you. Great. Okay, wonderful. Um, Okay, I share my presentation so that you can see uh, some examples of, uh, um, of uh, um, uh, what the communities of the, the two communities uh, produced during uh, the last years. I hope uh, you can see. And um, well, uh, as you said, I'm the coordinator of the Interreg Mag. Uh, uh, Blue Growth Community, and after this uh, fruitful uh, debate session, I would like to present you arguments why promoting green and blue innovation should move forward to together, facilitating the transition to more sustainable growth. Uh, we have a challenge. What is innovative and efficient today is not going to be sustainable in the future. We are in constant transition and growth implies increasing our carbon footprint. And then what can we do about it? Climate change mitigation and adaptation. And for this reason, we are here today for sharing best practices and promoting new governance models. Governance strategies and the real actions to eco innovation are needed for managing current and upcoming risks and for building socio ecological resilience. Circular economy is a resilient system that can tackle global challenges and address important social needs. It is a transition process based on three main principles. Eliminate waste and pollution, circulate products and materials, and regenerate nature. Today is the solutions day, and therefore the perfect space to share best practices and lessons learned about promoting green and blue growth innovation by adopting circular economy strategies. By this end, we aim to highlight the links between the green and the blue economy and the role of the public authorities to promote innovation in this field. And to show how uh, a 
and what the green and blue communities have been able to achieve thanks to, to the transnational uh, cooperation and more specifically thanks to the interreg map program. Governing the transition towards the green and blue econ uh, circular economies uh, have, has become imperative. Common challenges can be classified within the following categories, policy and governance, economy and finance, communication and collaboration, skills and capacity building, and market awareness and development. Taking in the uh, due consideration uh, uh, the, the challenges, the common challenges, we need to focus, to focus on the role of, um, of uh, the public authorities uh, and on their need to create and to adapt policy frameworks. They need to promote innovation and to facilitate the application of circular best practices. And uh, this is a joint effort. To this end, there is uh, room for improvement. And therefore, what ha have the two communities achieved thanks to the program and to the transnational cooperation? Um, here, I listed some main achievements. There is no time for reading, uh, but I only want to mention some. For example, they promoted the sustainable development through circular economy principles. They ensured the financial resources and support for sustainable development. They created the spaces for um, a dialogue to identify joint solutions and many more. Going uh, to uh, operative projects, uh, some examples of funded projects. Um, uh, within the waste prevention challenge, uh, the rain waste project addressed the waste management problem of inorganic materials such as plastic film, greenhouse uh, coverings, and food packaging in four uh, Mediterranean countries across uh, three agri-food uh, value chains, um, horticulture, meat, and dairy. Uh, solutions tested within the horticulture, but also within the other sectors were, for example, for the production side, uh, biodegradable and compostable fines, uh, but also levels of waste management agreements and many more. For the industrial side, the uh, main issue was, of course, uh, the packaging waste management. Um, uh, proposed measures included the use, for example, of eco-design. And for example, among the solutions tested uh, within the dairy sector, uh, we find uh, eco-design solutions uh, such as reducing the thickness of the silage film or bale packaging and many, many more. I don't have the time for listing uh, how many solutions were proposed by these uh, um, uh, projects. Um, uh, some lessons learned. The project final results uh, showcase uh, about the state of art, for example, that currently there is a lack of knowledge about affordable alternative to inorganic waste and the need to improve knowledge transfer and training activities uh, for farmers and industrial sectors. On the re replicability potential, the project found some solutions applied to other supply chains. And on the uh, side of challenges, uh, for example, uh, the high cost uh, of relevant barrier for introducing innovative solutions. Um, as for uh, policy making, uh, creating incentives for adopting innovative solutions to reduce inorganic waste and improve waste management. Summing up, the project proved the importance of innovative place-based circular actions concretely contributing to the objective of the new EU circular economy action uh, plan and the European strategy for plastics in a circular economy. Uh, turning to blue, um, it doesn't, okay. Turning to blue, we think uh, uh, fishing and aquaculture blue sectors, the Blue Fatma project has developed a circular self-assessment free online questionnaire available to registered users as a decision support tool to measure the company's 
circularity level and willingness to invest in circular economy principles. Based on that, the tool produces personalized recommendations. The uh, tool collects information related to the company's profile. Uh, some examples uh, are the approach uh, uh, on circular economy and environmental eco design, equipment, and many more information. And based on the user's answers, the tool automatically calculates the circular economy readiness index, showing companies' position at circular economy level. Uh, and the index of companies' willingness to invest in circular economy and it generates personalized guidelines. These personalized results help users in reviewing their current practices, comparing them with the provision of circular economy models. Um, some uh, uh, lessons learned. So we, uh, as, as a com Blue Growth community, um, uh, we provided some capitalization uh, to this tool. Uh, one example is the reference to the specific uh, sector of the aquaculture in the production of some paper, position papers. Um, in the, uh, the first uh, um, uh, contribution to, to national maritime spatial planning, uh, um, in, in these uh, specific position papers, uh, we are highlighted that, the, as demonstrated by Blue Phasma testing phase main conclusion, the level of circularity in the fishing and aquaculture sectors is rather low. And uh, uh, fishing and aquaculture remain traditional sectors based on traditional linear um, unsustainable model, consuming natural resources and polluting the environment. In this regard, uh, the, the community recommends using the maritime spatial planning as an instrument for fostering the sustainability of the sector and encourage aquaculture stakeholders in adopting circular practices. Uh, in this regard, a best practice uh, is the Blue Phasma Living Lab model. As well, the produced blue growth uh, community position on sustainable blue economy paper is a strong encouragement to development of circular economy uh, in the blue sector. Um, some key, uh, key cha uh, challenges in the sector have been identified by the Blue Phasma project and are, for example, uh, find alternative to plastics, share repair and the use of the material and many more. Um, as for the uh, policy recommendations, uh, one uh, um, key recommendation is to ensure financial resources. In the short run, blue enterprises shifting to circular uh, businesses will face a significant costs. In fact, the circular economy ensures economic savings in the long term, because the cost of recovering some material is still higher than their value. Another recommendation is the digitalization uh, as a powerful enable of circularity in the blue economy sector so for many reasons. Unfortunately, we don't have the time to go in depth. Uh, thanks to these years of experience, the green and blue growth communities rely on an extended network comprising four Helix stakeholders to further explore innovative tools um, and create... Uh, sorry, sorry, I am uh, so sorry to cut you short, Katerina, but we have got five minutes no, left. I that know, I know. I do it was wish just that my last government would hire you as advisor because i mean you are very very go into depth with everything you know all the answers but uh, we have got five minutes left and i i really do want to give uh, patricia carbonell the opportunity to close to to draw the conclusions because i mean there i think uh, that it is only right that she draws the conclusions because I mean that you are uh, right. address many many subjects many um, and you address also many solutions that have been put forward and of course also all the various bottlenecks that now are uh, well will always be sort of they are still present so uh, thank you Katerina and um, I just wanted to say, I'm sorry, Sergio Ponsa is the director, of course, of Vita Technological Center, um, as I, I mistook, uh, I, I didn't say that correctly in the beginning, but anyhow, now we have got five minutes left for the conclusions. 
and I don't know if there is uh, space for any questions, but Patricia Carbonell, back to you. Hello, I don't know if you can hear me. Uh, yep. Yes, we can hear yeah. you, but not see you. Yeah, unfortunately, it doesn't seem the camera is working. But anyway, uh, as you said, I think we already listened to some tangible examples of solutions being applied thanks to this program that will we will continue working on them uh, and then improving them and really trying to increase the collaboration i think that's key and without getting into further delay i would like to give the floor to fanny didu uh, because she has been capturing uh, in an image graphically uh, the main outcomes from this session so i think one image it's worth a thousand words, so I would like her to, to explain us a little bit as a graphic facilitator specialized in sustainability, what she managed to, to collect from all these ideas that we heard today. Hi, Fanny. Hi, thank you, Patricia. <laughs> thank you to all brilliant panelists and moderator. Thank you, Maria. I'm well, Fanny Didu, and I was here capturing the conversation visually. So now I'm gonna show you uh, the results uh, coming in a small video and maybe take the opportunity to highlight uh, two key elements that came across the session today. So first of all, the importance of having everyone on board in order to not repeating the mistakes of the past and manage to adapt and mitigate the effects of climate change. And this will take me to my second point it has been mentioned many times today. What has been achieved thanks to the program and the transnational cooperation show the power of collective action. Cooperation, collaboration is key. If we do not want to get into deep, deeper water between academia, public authorities, civil society and businesses working together towards this joint vision of, of the future. So this is a visual harvesting of the session as a reminder also to think in a holistic and systemic way. Thank you very much. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. I mean, to see it in a drawing is really, it's wonderful. It's much better than in words because I mean, we all do share the same knowledge, but to see it in a drawing uh, gifts and emotions, and emotions at times help to find solutions. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Uh, are there any questions? Do we have time for questions? Yes, no, don't know. No, two minutes, one question. Is there any question? Yes, no. Okay, yes, there is. Okay, fine. Please. Thank you. Uh, yes, I think, I mean, at the beginning of the conversation with Alessandra quick question and, quick and Mateo, answer. yeah, yeah, the question is very specific. Like, I think you didn't really go in deep into why circular economy is not a reality, because we have seen it's good for everyone, but it's not really the first option many times. So why, which are the challenges? Uh, probably that would take, I mean, two hour sessions. I mean, we <laughs> did post that question, but that if is a problem with conventions. That is a points. problem with time. But anyhow, who wants to answer? Yeah, I just want to tell you that, uh, you know, it's all new. It's happening now. So we are not here with serve solution because we are contributing ourselves to this change, which is happening, which I'm part of. You are part of, the colleagues are part of. So we are actually pooling knowledge to move in that direction. This, of course, will need time. It's not a change you can do from one day to the other, but uh, this is what we are all geared to. It will need time and the determination of everybody. I, I think that now we have no more time left. And thank you very much, everybody, and everybody who was uh, uh, online. Thank you uh, very much. Thank you.